everyone and thank you for zooming in today. It's really great to have you with us. I am Ruth Katz, co-director of Aspen Ideas Health and executive director of the Health Medicine Society program here at the Aspen Institute. I'm delighted to welcome you to another Aspen Ideas Health 2020 virtual event. While the COVID pandemic has prevented us from gathering in person, we are delighted to continue to host informative and inspiring conversations with leading health practitioners, advocates, artists, scientists, and innovators. And we couldn't be more excited about today's program, which bring together experts from Mount Sinai Health System to speak about two of the hottest COVID-related issues today, the race to develop a safe and effective COVID-19 vaccine and the availability of convalescent plasma to treat COVID-19, which has recently received FDA approval for use as an investigational product. Really, really important stuff. So let me jump right in with the introduction of our three terrific speakers. Dr. Ken Davis is the president and CEO of the Mount Sinai Health System in New York City, a city that experienced a severe outbreak of COVID-19 cases as the original US epicenter of the pandemic and served as a response model as the disease spread. With Dr. Davis at its helm, Mount Sinai has been at the forefront of medical research and treatment. He is a leader in the move away from fee-for-service medicine to population health, aiming to keep more patients healthy and out of the hospital. He is a neurobiologist by training, an elected member of the Institute of Medicine, and an author of more than 575 scientific articles. His numerous, numerous art, honors include the George H. W. Bush Lifetime of Leadership Award from Yale University, Dr. Davis is also an extended member of the Aspen Institute family. He is one of, and I have to say, one of our best trustees and a great friend of health medicine and society. Dr. Judith Aberg is the chief of infectious diseases for the Mount Sinai Health System. She is leading Mount Sinai's COVID-19 treatment guidelines and the COVID clinical trials unit. She created the Infectious Diseases Clinical and Translational Research Center, which was deployed in March to offer investigational therapeutics throughout the health system. Dr. Aberg is working collaboratively with other scientists in the development of diagnostics, exploring pathogenesis of SARS-CoV-2 and operationalizing studies for both treatment and prevention of SARS-CoV-2 infection. She has been instrumental in developing one of the country's first convalescent plasma programs to treat COVID-19 and is a member of the National Institutes of Health COVID-19 Treatment Guidelines Panel. Finally, Dr. Florian Kramer is the Mount Sinai Professor of Vaccinology at the Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai. He leads the Kramer Laboratory, part of the National Institutes of Health funded Centers for Excellence in Influenza Research and Surveillance and the Collaborative Influenza Vaccine Innovation Centers. His work focuses on understanding broadly reactive immune responses against viruses such as influenza with the goal of developing better vaccines and therapeutics. The lab is working to provide reagents and standardized protocols for COVID-19 testing and has developed an assay for Sears COVID-2 antibodies to determine if a person has been infected with the virus that causes COVID-19 and better understand both the antibiotic response and how antibodies respond or protect us from infection. I think you will agree it's a terrific panel. And again, we're very excited to have them all here. With that, we want to thank our speakers for taking time from their incredibly busy schedules to join, join us today for what undoubtedly promises to be both an incredibly timely and very interesting discussion. And of course, thanks again to all of you in our audience. We've got a very big audience today for being with us. We look forward to seeing you soon for our next Aspen Ideas Health event. A final thanks to you, Ken, and to Mount Sinai for your wonderful partnership over many, many years. It's always such a pleasure to be working with you and your team, and the Aspen stage is now yours. Thanks again for everything. Thank you, Ruth, and, and it's a pleasure to work with you. So let's begin um, with a little history. I want uh, 
people to have some appreciation of what the beginning of this pandemic was like at Mount Sinai. And then I'm going to transition to first talk about convalescent plasma, and then we'll go to vaccines, which I know everybody's very interested in. Um, we were overwhelmed in March with how many patients came with COVID to Mount Sinai. Um, we increased the number of our beds by 50%. Uh, we were on the phone almost daily with our governor. Um, we didn't know how bad it would be. Um, we added staff everywhere. We put on beds everywhere. Uh, the worst day we had, there were in our eight hospitals over 2,000 COVID patients. And on our worst day of mortality, we had 80 deaths. In the middle of that chaos, because we have a great strength in immunobiology, in virology, in creating vaccines, the two people that you're going to meet today were instrumental in thinking about new therapies and ways to measure antibodies. So I want to start with Judy and Florian and ask them this question. How in the middle of that chaos did you guys think about convalescent plasma? How did you decide to use it? And what have we learned from that convalescent plasma experience that was so nascent in March and then gets emergency approval months later? Judy, you want to start? Sure, absolutely. And, and thank you again for inviting me to be here. So convalescent plasma is something that has been used for decades, actually a century for different infectious diseases. And I was involved with the NIH back in 2009 for the H1N1 uh, influenza outbreak. And, and at that time, um, we had collected convalescent plasma and then it was um, you know, distributed and, and given throughout the country at those centers that were doing that study. So when COVID hit, it was actually a similar group of individuals all thinking at the same time, maybe co convalescent plasma would be the right thing to do here. Um, so there was a group of colleagues across the country that we all were emailing and chatting, you know, how should we do this? And a group started working on the protocols that we initially had hoped we would do randomized controlled trials um, so that we could really look at efficacy. And the FDA released that emergency IND, which allowed us then to go ahead and jumpstart and be able to offer that to individuals that were really ill. And so uh, Mount Sinai and then uh, Methodist Hospital in Houston both uh, gave the first uh, doses or you know infusions, transfusions of convalescent plasma in March. And um, you know, I think it, it was a tremendous effort by many to do this. So, um, but Mount Sinai really then, you know, we went all in to develop this convalescent plasma, be able to offer it to the patients. Um, and we initially were able to transfuse 39 individuals. And looking at our preliminary results, we, we noticed that they, the oxygen status of our patients improved much more than the patients who had not get, been given it. Now that's the caveat, this was not a randomized trial, so we just have matched controls from that time point, but it suggested very promising therapies. Right, and we knew that it had a biological plausibility from so many other diseases, um, but it was facilitated by being able to measure antibodies. Um, because you've got to take that plasma from people who are recovering. So Florian, tell us about antibodies, how you developed the assay, why it was available so quickly. Um, we were the first people to do it, and it was essential. So give us the history of antibodies and how it fits in with the convalescent plasma story. So basically, we know that for many virus infections, antibodies are something that your body develops in order to fight the virus. And antibodies are very often able to neutralize virus to basically get rid of them. Um, and that is certainly also the case for coronaviruses and that's well known. And so if you use plasma, plasma uh, contains antibodies. Um, and if you had a SARS coronavirus 2 infection, in many cases you make a lot of antibodies that are present in your plasma that can neutralize the virus. And so uh, we started uh, pretty early to develop tests to measure these, uh, these types of antibodies. Uh, so the sequence of the virus was released on January 10th. 
And at that point, it beca became clear that uh, we are dealing with a beta coronavirus uh, that looked very much like the SARS virus of 2003, and it uh, probably behaves very similar. And so uh, for me, it was clear that uh, this could be a problem. And so we started very quickly to produce from the released sequence uh, reagents uh, to build uh, tests that allow us to measure antibodies. And these tests were basically ready uh, in February. So it took us approximately a month, one and a half months from knowing the sequence to establishing the assays. And so my laboratory is a research assay, uh, a research laboratory. And so um, we transferred the assay then into our clinical laboratory and that allowed it to uh, be used uh, to measure antibody responses in patients and to collect um, convalescent plasma. And that was uh, in March. So how high, does, is this everybody, anybody who's had COVID get enough antibodies that we could have used them? Or how do we choose where to get those, that plasma from? And how did your assay help us with that? So the vast majority of individuals that get infected with SARS-CoV-2 make antibodies. To High enough levels, though, for us to use as a therapeutic? Exactly, and that's the, the important point. You want to have a plasma that has very high amounts of these antibodies, and uh, the assay allows you to look for that. Uh, it's a quantitative assay, so you can measure how much antibody is there, and you can actually then select the donors based on how much antibody they have. And that's very important to select the right donors. Right, so you're being a little modest because nobody else has a quantitative antibody assay. Um, yours was the first. Yours is the only quantitative antibody assay. And there are a lot of other antibody assays that aren't nearly as specific or can't be used for this purpose. But any rate, so thanks to you, we're able to then measure the right amount, get the right plasmas from people who have the high levels of antibodies, and Judy's able to infuse them. But Judy, how did you decide when in the course of illness to infuse, who to infuse, and were you really convinced? How long did it take you to be convinced you were doing the right thing, giving it at the right time to the right people? So those are great questions. I think historically when you look, and it, and it makes sense that you want to transfuse people with convalescent plasma containing those antibodies, before individuals make their own antibodies. Just a little bit more, I think, almost common sense, right? If somebody's already developed their own antibodies, probably giving more antibodies is not gonna change their course. So when we initially uh, started this program, we um, offered it to individuals that were within the first seven days of their hospitalization. So we wanted people early in their course and and I think as time went on, we did learn a little bit more about, you know, timing was really important. After, you know, more like 10, 14 days, individuals really are starting to produce their own antibodies, and there is less likely to see any benefit. The other is that now that we've transfused over 500 individuals and starting to look at that data, um, individuals who have less comorbidities, individuals that are younger, um, people that get transfused before they're on mechanical ventilation seem to do better. So our own impression without having those, like I said, the randomized controlled trials, is that the earlier in the course of the disease that you give them, it's most likely to be beneficial. Okay, so let's, let's move on to vaccines. Everybody wants to know when there's gonna be a vaccine. Um, but I don't have to tell you, but I wanna tell everybody who's listening, the vast number of vaccines that get into clinical trials fail. Um, I've seen a number that suggests that 94% of vaccines that enter clinical trials never make it into people, either for lack of efficacy or safety. Yet we're all waiting with bated breath in the expectation that something's around the corner. Give us, each of you, your best thoughts on where do we really stand with vaccines today and when do you think we're gonna have something that could be safe and effective? Judy, you wanna start? Sure, I'll, I'll be happy to start. 
So there's several vaccine candidates out there that I think may be beneficial. When you think about vaccines, I'm, I'm more simplistic. I think about vaccines that are either protein-based, which are the common ones that we give now, what like flu vaccine, where we're giving um, an attenuated flu or recombinant protein. Um, and then so to, to help people so we don't get them in jargon. Yep. By protein, you mean the virus, a piece of the, the virus. virus. Yeah, no. pieces of the virus. You're, so you're, you're, giving, you're vaccinating people with a piece of the virus. Right, correct. Okay. And then you can use gene-based vaccines. And that's what is has a lot of enthusiasm right now. And by gene-based vaccines, what I mean is it has pieces of that genetic material from the of the of the, the spike protein. The spike protein on this virus is what enters the cell. So you want to make antibodies against that spike protein. So what they're doing is they take little what we call nucleic acids, the beginning of the building blocks for proteins, either DNA, something called messenger RNA, or you can take another type of virus make a little cut in it and insert some of the COVID protein in it, so sequences in it. These gene-based vaccines, what they do is that it goes into your cells and instructs your cells how to make spike protein, right? And when your body sees spike protein, then it starts making antibody. So that, that's the thought behind the different types of vaccines that we're looking at. So right now, um, so there are a couple of vaccines that are in what we call the phase three, where we're starting to look that we've got preliminary evidence on safety, a hint of maybe there's some efficacy. But I wanna point out when people talk about efficacy, they're just talking about that the body has made antibody responses. Nobody has shown that if you give vaccine to one person and placebo to another, that you actually have protected them yet. So we haven't, we don't have true efficacy data. What we have is that we know some of these vaccines seem to produce a pretty prominent antibody response in the individual. We don't know how long they're gonna last. We don't really know if they're protective. So I personally think it's unwise to use what we call this emergency use authorization where the FDA can do that to, because it may be a benefit, right? What we really wanna know is that it truly is benefit, right? That right. it's truly going to form antibodies, you're gonna have a response and you're protected from getting COVID. And, and that's going to take much longer. I really don't see that happening in 2020. Okay, but let's summarize what you said because it's really important yep. um, that there are different ways to make vaccines for the body to make a response. So we're using some new techniques here and some old techniques here. And that what we've seen so far is that they, these vaccines get us antibody responses, which is good, but we don't know whether it's working yet to prevent disease because we haven't shown yet that these vaccines are significantly diminishing the likelihood that people are gonna get COVID compared to people on placebo. But right. let's, let's step back a second, because I wanna ask Florian, um, and Judy may wanna chime in after Florian on this. Um, no one's ever made a genetic vaccine yet. What, what Moderna is trying to do, and what Pfizer is trying to do, has so far not been done. Um, how likely is it and why are we starting with a completely new way and do you think it was it's safer to do what some of the other companies are doing which is taking just a piece of the virus and trying to inject that I mean how excited or how um, realistic is it to have started with a completely new technology after all Moderna doesn't have a single successful vaccine for all the work they've been doing Florian yeah, that's certainly correct. There are no genetic vaccines that are on the market for humans. Uh, Moderna has not licensed a single vaccine. Uh, there's no Moderna vaccine on the market right now. However, these technologies are exciting uh, because they're a new way, a very fast way to make vaccines. 
And if we go back a little bit into um, preclinical experience, meaning testing in animals, and there are very good animal models for uh, SARS coronavirus 2, specifically in, uh, in primates, in uh, monkeys, uh, we see that these vaccines work really well in protecting these monkeys. Um, but I completely agree that um, it is a very good strategy to have many different candidates. Some of them build on new platforms um, like the RNA vaccines, like these genetic vaccines, but also um, platforms that are based on more traditional approaches. And I think that's kind of the safety net that we have. As you said, a lot of vaccine trials fail, but if you go with many different and very uh, diverse approaches, it is very likely that one of these approaches or even more succeeds. And we already see um, that the more classical approaches of using bits and pieces of the virus as a vaccine antigen uh, are also working very well. There is data from uh, Novavax, for example, uh, that, that are pretty promising they're not as far as, uh, for example, Moderna in, in their evaluation in humans, um, but these are promising approaches too, although they are more classic or you could even say old fashioned. So I think it's good to test these new approaches, but it's also good to have backup approaches that are based on classic technology. So these big phase three vaccine trials will enter 30,000 patients 15,000 get placebo, 15,000 get vaccines. Um, but we are concerned that there are various subgroups of population that differ from each other. So how do we know, for instance, when this vaccine might be approved, that'll get emergency approval, that 75 year olds who have less of a ability to mount immune response should be taking this vaccine how do we know, for instance, that enough minority groups have been included so that the group that we know is getting most affected is also going to have a good response? Tell us what you know about the inclusion of enough groups so that we can make the right decisions about subgroups of patients. So, Judy, what do you think? So right now, I have to say that, you know, the Moderna and Pfizer both have been in the news talking about the challenges of really recruiting minority populations. As we know, Blacks and Hispanics were two and a half times more likely to suffer consequences from COVID, yet this is the population that we have challenges enrolling. And so, you know, they I think we need to do a better job as a country educating and, and really going out to the communities that are most at need. And I, and I think we've failed a little bit on that as overall, as far as our recruitment strategies. At, at Sinai, we're taking uh, you know, much more action to go out to the communities, having focus groups, trying to engage the community that's most at risk. And so that is, includes minorities. It also includes uh, older patients as well as patients with comorbidities. I think, you know, when you look at who died from COVID, it was more so older individuals with multiple comorbidities. And typically those are not the, the individuals that are coming to be recruited into, normally you think about healthy volunteer studies. So doing those types of targeting uh, recruitment strategies are going to be very important for this. Um, both Moderna and Pfizer, uh, you know, the minority enrollment's been less than 15% overall, and that's, that's just not acceptable. And, and more so to your, your question, Ken, how will we know um, with older individuals that it works? So some of the, the trials actually are stratifying by age. Um, Johnson & Johnson, the Janssen vaccine, which is a uh, uh, what we call an adenovirus type, where you take a common respiratory virus, adenovirus, and you insert part of the, the COVID sequences in there. They actually are stratifying at entry for individuals 18 to like 60, and then the next group being like 60 and older, so that they can actually have the number that they need to 
to evaluate that. And their sample size is 60,000 compared to Moderna and Pfizer, that's 30,000. So I think that's what we really need to do is we need to stratify um, upfront. And then again, they can do afterwards, they can look at uh, subpopulations as well to see what the response is. Right. So we're going to have to look for that data when it comes out and hopefully it will be readily available. So every subgroup of patients is going to be able to know, is this going to work for me? Right. Um, help us with, both of you, help us with this question. There may very well be within six or eight months, more than one vaccine. How will you choose? And could you take a second vaccine if you've already gotten the first vaccine? What are your thoughts? Florian, you want to start? Um, yes, sure. Um, actually, I think it would be good to have more than one vaccine, specifically if uh, the one of the first vaccines that gets licensed is one that is based on uh, these more modern technologies. We know already from phase one, two trials that the RNA, the genetic vaccines, but also the adenovirus vaccines uh, cause more reactogenicity. And what I mean by reactogenicity is that you get a sore arm, uh, that you might get a slightly uh, higher temperature, that you might feel flu-like symptoms from the vaccine. And uh, if you have one of those vaccines that already does that in, in, in adults, uh, it might do that at a much higher rate in children. So it might be good to have at least a second vaccine candidate or a second vaccine on the market uh, that is based on classic technologies that does not do that. So I think that's a really important point. Um, the question about combining vaccines is something that will need to be studied in the future. We have seen for some experimental influenza vaccines that actually taking vaccine A followed by vaccine B can somebody sometimes give you a superior immune response and superior protection, but it could also be the other way around. So these, uh, these mix and match strategies need to be tested and it's clear uh, that this will happen um, yep. once people get vaccinated. So, so Judy, let's assume just hypothetically that we get vaccine one, which is said to be 55% effective, which is, they say we have to be more than 50% effective to get approved, but we all want a vaccine, so 55 gets approved. And the second one is 60%. So we don't have any single vaccine that's gonna do 95 or 100%. Do you start to tell people you better get both of them? So, yeah, I mean, obviously, as, as Florian was saying, there's insufficient knowledge right now about combining vaccines. Um, one thing that sometimes we do with vaccines is you give a vaccine and then you test, you know, a couple of months later to see if you've had an immune response. So you could see if they, in fact, did have an antibody response. And then in those that are the non-responders, consider giving a second vaccine. And we do that for hepatitis B now. Um, the other is that we do have some knowledge of giving different types of vaccine. We do this for pneumococcus, which is a type of bacteria that commonly causes lung infections or in kids ear infections. And we had one type of vaccine that we were giving and then another one got developed. And now we do give them in a sequence eight weeks apart. So we do have some experience about with vaccines, giving one and then almost doing a booster or covering different aspects of, of you know, whatever we're, we're trying to build immunity against. So I'm gonna ask you guys one more question before we throw it open to everybody who's watching. And that's how concerned are you that there will be many people who are afraid of vaccines or who won't trust this vaccine. And if we get a very a low turnout of people being vaccinated, what do you think are the consequences of that for the population? Judy, you wanna start and then Florian? Sure, so um, no, I think there are gonna be individuals who are concerned about getting vaccine. We already have that with influenza itself, only about 50% of whites in America get vaccinated. And it's much lower in minority groups, even as low as, as 20, 30%. So we already know that we're going to have individuals that are reluctant to take the vaccine for many different reasons. And this is where I also think that we need to keep developing these other 
types of therapies for prophylaxis for prevention. So monoclonal antibodies where we make like laboratory-based antibodies, just like your bloodstream does, that we can give to individuals to prevent them from getting COVID. Um, the convalescent plasma program at Mount Sinai, what we're doing is we have a partnership with Emergent Biosolutions, who is making a product called hyperimmune globulin, which is purified antibodies from the plasma that then doesn't have to be blood type specific. Individuals that don't want to be vaccinated or don't respond to a vaccine can be given this hyperimmune globulin at a period of, or, you know, frequency <clears throat> to prevent getting COVID as well. But I think it really comes back to, can really the wearing of the masks, good hand hygiene, the social distancing, that's still gonna be very important over the course of this next year. Lorian, what, what are your concerns about people who don't get vaccinated and what this means for ultimately get herd immunity? Well, uh, there's two groups of people that might not get vaccinated. We have the classical uh, anti-vax uh, individuals that just refuse to get vaccinated and they don't think they are the problem. Uh, in this case, uh, I think what we need to make sure of is that people who are skeptical because these are now new vaccines and they have been developed very quickly, uh, they need to be convinced that uh, these vaccines are safe and effective. And I think to make sure that people understand that and people trust the vaccines, we need a very uh, transparent process of getting these vaccines licensed and everything needs to be done by the book. I think that's uh, the most imp important uh, um, message to people who might be skeptical about vaccines. We need to do a very thorough uh, evaluation of efficacy of these vaccines and of safety. And I think if that is done and if it's done in a transparent way, and if it's communicated well, uh, I think then a lot of people will actually trust the vaccines and will get vaccinated. Okay. So I've been looking at some questions, and let me give you some of the more provocative ones um, that I think will um, give us some very important information. Some people are pointing out that they've heard that this, vac this virus mutates. Will that affect our vaccines? Should we be worried about mutations? Are the mutations like the flu vaccine mutation, you know, the flu mutations which cause us to need vaccines, new ones every year? So tell us about it. COVID mutations, COVID-19 mutations, and whether it's gonna impact subsequent vaccine policy. Go ahead, Florian. Yeah, I think I, I can take that question. Um, so we have to be careful. We shouldn't look too much at flu. Uh, flu is a very different beast. Uh, we know that all RNA viruses mutate. That doesn't mean that they change in a way that they would uh, require a new vaccine. Uh, measles, for example, is an RNA virus that mutates, and we are still using vaccine strain from the 1960s, and they work very well. Um, and we also have experience from human coronaviruses in the population that cause common colds, and those viruses don't change much. And so, um, in addition to that evidence, we also know that coronaviruses, compared to other RNA viruses, have a proofreading activity, so they actually mutate less. So there's many factors that come together that suggest that this virus will not readily mutate and that we will not need a vaccine every year, uh, a new vaccine every year, like for influenza. Okay, so here's another important question. We've heard a lot about comorbidities and people who are immunosuppressed. Given the rapidity with which this vaccine is being developed, um, they're sure that there won't be a lot of people who might be on immunosuppressants or have important comorbidities. So should people with comorbidities and immunosuppressants get this vaccine? Judy, what do you think? What should we tell those people? So in the clinical trials now, again, some of the companies are in fact um, limiting the, the amount of comorbidities or the type of comorbidities. Um, whereas other companies are going to are more wide open, and they in fact are, they're including individuals who have HIV, hepatitis B, hepatitis C, and there aren't immunosuppressive agents. Um, so I'm hoping that more companies will follow suit with the ones that are having a, a broader availability, because you're absolutely right, at the end of the day, 
it is the people that are most at risk that you would want to offer vaccine to. Right. So but we but really... assume that we don't have that kind of data early on. What would you tell someone who's on immunosuppressants? Should they get the vaccine? I, I would do it. I, I absolutely would encourage doing it. I've been you know, uh, taking care of people with HIV for a long time, and we had the same issue with vaccines. They weren't tried um, in the HIV population, so they were excluded from the trials. But we, you know, we've learned and, and we've given and, and they work. So I think that we should, we should absolutely do that. And again, we can test antibodies to see if they have a durable response. Okay. Here's a very interesting question. Why is the number of new COVID patients so low in New York now and in the neighboring states? Could it possibly be that this area already has herd immunity? Florian, you want to take it? Yeah, I can take that question. Um, so we have to be careful when we talk about herd immunity. It's not a black and white thing. Of course, if 20% or 25% of the population already have some type of immune response to the virus, which is the case in New York City, uh, of course, the reproductive number of the virus or how it spreads is a little bit lower than if everybody would have uh, would be na completely naive. But you also have to keep in mind that uh, behavior in New York City uh, changed a lot. Uh, people are sticking to wearing masks, um, and that's really important. We don't have indoor dining. Um, a lot of activities are carried out outside where the risk of getting infected is much lower. So I think right now it has to do a lot uh, with behavior. Um, and there is, of course, uh, the risk that we'll have another wave in New York City. Uh, this is a possibility, and we hope that um, with the behavior that, uh, that people here uh, show right now uh, that we can suppress that uh, that we can suppress a second wave, but at this point, I would not bank on herd immunity in most areas on this uh, on this planet. So you would suggest that the reason New York is so low right now is because people have been using masks and are socially distant, and it has nothing to do with how many people have already been infected. Um, I think that's the main reason why we have very few cases right now. Um, there is an influence if you have 20% uh, uh, immune or um, antibodies, uh, individuals that have antibodies, of course that lowers uh, the reproductive number and how fast the virus can spread. But I don't think that's the main driving factor right now. Okay, Here, here's a question for Judy. Are there plans to pool data from the small randomized controlled trials for plasma treatment and have the randomized controlled trials been hampered by the emergency use authorization? What do you think? So there is a group that is trying to pull the data together. You know, the caution with that is that, you know, the eligibility criteria differs, um, you know, the testing that was done differs. So, you know, pulling data like that may or may not really give us the answers that we want. Um, I do think the emergency use authorization, again, because it's wide open. It says, you know, if there's any chance somebody may benefit, it's okay to give. And I think that has um, diluted down potentially the benefit that we may be seeing as people have been, you know, uh, transfusing convalescent plasma much later individuals. I will say that there was just recently a study, it's, it's in preprint right now from India, where they did a randomized controlled trial, although it's open label. So you know who got plasma and who was given other standard of care. Um, it was interesting, they did not see a benefit there. The difference in mortality between those that received convalescent plasma versus those that didn't, they didn't see any difference. But I'm gonna say the caveat being that over 80% of the people receiving plasma already had antibodies. Mm -hmm. Going back to my point that if we really want to, to be able to show that convalescent plasma or any type of antibody therapy is beneficial, it needs to be given before an individual makes their own antibodies. Good. So since COVID-19 is one of many coronaviruses, do you think there's a potential for a universal coronavirus vaccine some point in the future? 
Um, so um, I'll answer with a cautious yes. Um, we are doing something similar uh, for influenza right now. There are several universal influenza virus vaccines in clinical trials. Uh, and so far, there is very promising data. So um, if you can do that for influenza viruses, which are very diverse, it might also be possible to do that for coronaviruses. Um, now, getting to that point will probably take a lot of time, and it's probably not going to be easy to show that you have universal protection. But from the basis of uh, how antibodies recognize diverse coronaviruses and from uh, all the knowledge that we have, uh, we have gathered in the last couple of months, uh, it might be possible to uh, design a vaccine that at least broadly protects against um, zoonotic uh, coronaviruses, meaning coronaviruses that spill over from animals into humans. Okay, so um, here's, here's a question that I think you're going to find easy to answer, but I think we, we should address it. Uh, if someone in your family or close associate has already had COVID, you know you're exposed to it, should you still get the vaccine? I, I think that, you know, if you yourself do not have antibodies, I absolutely think you should be vaccinated. I think it's less known if you have, if you have your own antibodies, you know, I, I don't think at this point I would promote doing vaccines. Although I will tell you again, in the trials, we are not checking antibodies first because you, when you think about when you're gonna roll this out to millions, if not billions of people globally, you, you're not gonna do any testing before you would give it. So you would want to just give vaccine to everybody without knowing what their antibody status was. And if I hadn't, if I never had COVID, but somebody in my family did and I was exposed. And I know as a healthcare worker, I've been exposed a lot. I would still get the vaccine. Right. But if you know you have antibodies, then and you need to get the vaccine? I no. think that, no, Go. probably not. And it would depend too, you know, what is your antibody response? The, what we still don't know is how durable that response is. You know, most individuals, as Florian mentioned, had very high antibody levels that we checked. There are some individuals that despite having COVID don't have antibodies. So in those individuals I would, or if they were low, or if they wane over time, right? And those are the, that's all the uncertainty that we have at this point. Right, um, but can we get people to feel a little bit more relieved around the question of how long will the vaccine work? I mean, there are some people who talk about it may only last for a month or two. So what do you think we should tell them, Florian? Yeah, the so that, that, is, that is relatively easy to answer. Uh, if you just, you know, there are no vaccines that only work for two months. Um, that's just not how the immune system works. Um, and uh, it might be that you need a booster vaccination after, let's say, three years or four years. Uh, that could be possible if the, if the antibody response wanes. But to be honest, that's not really a disaster. There are vaccines that are given in those intervals. Um, for, for example, you need to get a, a tetanus shot every now and then to boost up your antibody titers. And if you end up with a scenario like that where you need to get a booster dose every few years, uh, that would not be a yeah. big problem. But um, it's very unlikely that uh, a vaccine would not induce uh, an antibody response or an immune response that would not at least be durable for a number of years. Um, and we see now more and more, and I know that there were media reports initially that the antibody responses after natural infections go away very quickly. Uh, there is now a, a lot of very solid data that says that this is a very normal immune response to a uh, um, respiratory virus. So what we see is uh, right after infection, you get a lot of antibody uh, that stays uh, very high for a few months, and then it goes down a little bit, and then it stabilizes over time. So it looks very normal, and there is no reason to believe that a vaccine-induced antibody response would look different. So... Here's my last question, then we're going to have to say goodbye to our viewers. Um, are you concerned that political pressure 
to the FDA will result in emergency authorization before we really have convincing proof of safety and efficacy. I've been Both very you concerned about that. Um, I, I think it will be a mistake if we release a vaccine before we have more data. I think an emergency use authorization, as I mentioned before, just says that there may be benefit, but there may not. And I, and I think the ramifications to the public will be great if we release a vaccine before we actually know it's safe and that it works. Because the worst thing you want to do is vaccinate, again, millions of people, and then it doesn't work. Because then there's just uh, you know, additional mistrust and distrust in, in what we're doing, and it'll affect future vaccine efforts. So I think Florida, it's really think important it, we follow this yeah. through. Well, Florian, any thought, last thoughts on that I'm, question? I'm worried too. I know that there is a lot of very good scientists at the FDA and I trust them. Uh, we have also seen that uh, vaccine producers push back on that. But I can only echo what Judy said. I think it's very important to evaluate these vaccines very thoroughly. And once we know they are effective and safe, then they should be licensed and not before that. All right. Well, thank you both for very informative 45 minutes. And thank you, Ruth Katz and the Aspen Institute for making this possible.